the Fed is operating independently, and the president has underscored the importance of the Fed operating independently. We have to be prepared for that Russia once again uh, chooses confrontation. Mr. Speaker, I want to apologize. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. inflation hits a four-decade high. James Bullard now sees four rate hikes in 2022. Boris Johnson buys time. The U.K. Prime Minister apologizes before Parliament, but dismisses calls for his resignation. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we talk to a U.K.-based unicorn, Gusto. It's a meal kit service that secured a $100 million funding from SoftBank. You can send in your questions on startups. Of course, the UK food market on IB Plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. And there's quite a lot going on because we're expecting a little bit later that employment figure. But also what we, of course, want to look out for is that PPI. Yesterday, CPI, broad inflation. We were expecting that, but it does give us a good indication of what the market has mispriced or not. I've seen a lot of opinion pieces today look at the bond market because it just doesn't make sense in terms of valuations overall compared to equities. And then we, of course, had uh, the St. Louis Fed president saying that he's now expecting four rate hikes instead of the three. Watch out for dollar. You can see at the moment we chose the Bloomberg U.S. dollar index um, continuing in terms of uh, some pressure that we saw there compared to euro and pound, 116, uh, well, 1164. And then European stocks down some three-tenths of a percent. Now, if you look at the broader market and look at the difference, for example, between the U.K., where the Bank of England has really been at the forefront of some of the hawkish moves. They're ahead of the curve when you look at uh, the impact of inflation on its economy, uh, but then the Prime Minister being ensnared in this latest scandal. The FTSE down some two-tenths of eight percent, similar losses for uh, the DAX, and then we have a great big take, actually, on the presidential election coming up in France. The CAC 40 down five-tenths of eight percent. Now, the biggest annual gain in U.S. inflation in nearly four decades all but guarantees a series of rate hikes by the Fed this year. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says he's confident that inflation will return to 2% in the long term. If you look at financial market indicators of where do financial markets think inflation is going over the long term, over the long term, they're solidly in the camp that inflation is going back to historical levels of around 2%. So that's, I mean, I don't overweight that. That's one data point that we pay attention to, but that at least gives us some confidence well, to talk about the markets, we're joined by our markets editor, Christina Keenan, by Stephanie Kelly, deputy head of Aberdeen's Research, Research Institute. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Christina, I mean, the, you know, I don't know whether it sets finally the great debate of whether that great inflation of 2022 was, you know, transitory or not. But if we see something that's much more entrenched, what does it mean in terms of repricing for bonds? Well, Francine, I think that means that bonds will have a lot of catching up to do because as we were talking earlier, you know, there really is still a lot of room for those bond yields to mark very, very high, um, especially compared with the fact that the inflation is at a 40-year high. And, you know, we've talked about the number of structural factors that have pinned bond yields over the past decade. Most prominently, of course, the, the Federal Reserve itself uh, standing as the buyer of last resort of these bonds and keeping those yields in check. But, of course, now that we're entering this new era of less accommodative policy, then bonds will really have to adjust to this new rea reality, potentially much faster faster than they're currently doing. Yeah, and this is a million dollar question. I mean, I feel like we've been talking about it for so many years. Stephanie, this is a year where we actually do see a repricing. We have also a great opinion piece, which was my morning must read, looking at, you know, Kevin Moore basically believes that traders are working off outdated playbook that assumes the recovery will be like the sluggish one post financial crisis. And this time it could just be very different. I think this kind of a, a crisis is clearly one in which we've all as individuals and within the financial markets tried to get to grips with. Obviously, there are specific supply challenges that we're seeing at the moment, particularly as a result of Omicron and creating those challenges around supply chains that we continue to see be an issue. That being said, we are factoring in that those supply chain pressures should start to weaken, but that's going to be the crucial question for markets and for investors. If those supply chain pressures don't start to ease, if there's something different going on here, that's the challenge. But we know from the kind of what's driving the supply chain challenges, some of it is related to COVID. So as that starts to ease, if we truly are going through towards a more endemic phase, we should start to see that pull off.
So, of course, the million dollar question is actually can these central banks then keep, keep, you know, keep a check on inflation? Absolutely, Francine. And that's what we're going to have to wait and see to find out. I mean, we've seen, for instance, commentary from the Federal Reserve officials this week really trying to walk that fine line between tackling inflation but still indicating that they're not going to do too much that it starts hurting growth. But I think, you know, just what we're seeing from the dollar's moves uh, this week and more recently, just this refusal to kind of follow those uh, bond yields higher tells you a little bit something about those concerns regarding the growth inflation balance moving forward. So what does it mean, Stephanie, of how you look at your research? Are there any parts of the market that look particularly either uncovered or actually mispriced? So it's interesting, what we've spent a lot of time talking about within the Institute lately is that growth inflation trade-off and the differing challenges that central banks face. I think particularly it's a hard time to be a central banker if you're facing the issue of high inflation, low growth. But the other thing we've been looking at a lot is this politicization of inflation and increasing the expectation that that people like President Biden can tackle inflation, which we know is, is a really limited thing. And I think that has really interesting implications for the growth and market outlook for the rest of the year. Yeah, and this is one of the things that actually, you know, links to one of your, your morning must reads, uh, Christine, which is basically buy stimulus or budget cuts threaten growth around the world. And it's looking at this interplay. Absolutely, Francine. And it's going to be really interesting to see again this year where it will be a year where we see that pullback in monetary policy support, just as we could see a similar pullback in the fiscal stimulus as we head back towards that post-pandemic normal um, that we're all looking forward to. And But, you know, again, that situation, when you have economies that have really relied on both levers for quite a while, um, it's going to be a big adjustment. And it's going to be interesting to see which economies are really best place to weather this and which ones are the worst. Um, Stephanie, talk to me about the Bank of England. It seems that actually the Bank of England ha it has front run what was going on with inflation, maybe handled it better than other major central banks, and that has implications for the pound going forward. Well, I think it's interesting for the UK in, in, in many ways. I mean, the Bank of England is reflective, as, as we're seeing now, it's three rate hikes pricing in for, for 2022. But I think the UK is also in an interesting position from the COVID kind of experience itself in this sense that there's a relative openness to the UK economy that's not reflected in a number of European economies as well. I think that that direct interplay between between where com uh, where countries are at in terms of COVID, where governments are in, are in terms of restrictions, are feeding directly into then the inflationary pressures. We also know in the UK as well, there are specific challenges around, there have been around energy prices and things like that. There's always idiosyncratic factors, but I think at the moment it is very much, if you want to understand the outlook for growth and inflation, you've got to understand the outlook for COVID. And it seems like for the UK at the moment, that gamble of using plan B limited measures is paying off for the government so far. All right. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Our Bloomberg Markets editor, Christina Kino and Stephanie Kelly, deputy head of Aberdeen's Research Institute. She stays with us. Now, we're also looking at uh, some of the things outside the world of markets. And this is France just moments ago saying they will ease the UK border restrictions for vaccinated people. In fact, France is coming up with new rules that will apply from this Friday. UK travelers no longer need an essential reason to go to France and they will no longer have to isolate. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on that throughout the day. Now, Boris Johnson apologizes for attending a work party during the first COVID lockdown as he faces calls to resign. So that's our story next. This is Bloomberg. With hindsight, I should have sent everyone back inside. I should have found some other way to thank them. And I should have recognized that even if it could be said technically to fall within the guidance, there would be millions and millions of people who simply would not see it that way.
All right, the Prime Minister there, Boris Johnson, apologizing for the latest Downing Street lockdown party scandal in Parliament yesterday. Now, the question is whether the Prime Minister has bought some breathing space for himself. Anger in his ruling Conservative Party means his grip on power is actually precarious. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's David Merritt, and we're also joined by Stephanie Kelly, Deputy Head of Aberdeen's Research Institute. David, what a treat to have you on air. I know you were covering politics for a very long time. I mean, look, my question is, first of all, I mean, we debated in domestic LACWA whether this was an apology or saying, well, I didn't know the rules. But how precarious is his position? Does you know? Does he stay as prime minister? Well, he was he's there today, uh, but you know, yesterday was undoubtedly one of the worst days of his political career. You listen to the reaction there in the House of Commons that apology, a little mealy mouth. Was it some of it? Some some laughter at some points or derision really when he says maybe it was still within the rules. And reports that after his apology, he was doing the rounds in Parliament, saying, "Well, really, I've done nothing." wrong. So as often with this Prime Minister, an apology isn't quite the apology that some might expect or demand. And of course, we've got calls from not only from the opposition for his resignation, but also from people in his own side, you know, people like the leader of the Scottish Conservatives last night telling him his position is no longer yeah. tenable. That's a very serious position for any Prime Minister to be in. So David, who actually decides whether he stays Prime Minister at the moment? Again, for our international audience, is it, you know, the, the right-wing party that for the moment is still supporting him? Is it if his polls get too bad, then they'll want another leader? Or, or is it all in the investigation? Well, clearly he's not going to step down. I think he's made that pretty clear. So the only way to get rid of a sitting Prime Minister for his, uh, is for his own MPs to force him out. There needs to be a leadership contest um, uh, triggered. We're not there yet. Clearly there is this investigation going. Most people are hanging back a little bit at this point and saying, let's wait for the results of that inquiry. That could be next week. It could be the week after. We're not entirely sure. Mr Johnson, of course, will be hoping that in that interim, something else comes up that maybe deflects attention or maybe the heat comes out of this argument. But of course, the signs so far are for the opposite to be happening. In fact, his poll ratings in amongst the public continue to slide. Yeah, and, and Stephanie, there is almost a realization in the market, or the market hasn't really done much about this because this is just another scandal that the prime minister is, or the market thinks he'll get through it. I mean, we're speaking to U.S. investors saying, well, this is just a storm in a key teacup. Yeah, I think it is. I think for those who are interested in kind of the longer term UK political outlook and the, you know, when it comes to the next election, which obviously a leadership election doesn't necessarily trigger a general election in the UK, that's not how it tends to work. So it, it kind of pushes off the issue. I think where it's relevant to investors is insofar as Johnson has been so successful and indeed it's acknowledged in his party. He's not widely liked within his own kind of party, but he is liked with voters and that's been the key to his success. But it also could be the key to his downfall because he is more reliant on popularity with voters than many other leaders. If he is to go at some point in this year and obviously if he can weather this short term st storm, we look then to the May elections as a potential point at which he gets kind of under more pressure again. I think the bigger question becomes, does a new leader retain the red wall seats that the Tories were able to pick up in the last election. If not, you could be looking at a Labour government and that kind of switch can be more relevant to investors because it becomes a question of what does fiscal policy look like? What does the regulatory environment look like? That's where it becomes more investor relevant, I think. And Dave, I was going to ask you actually about you know some of the succession. Tories Raphael just put out a great opinion piece saying, look, a Tory succession battle is now underway. Is there an automatic successor? Is it? I know that you know we talk a lot about the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. Yeah, well, and it was telling, wasn't it, yesterday? Those two sort of holding back. Uh, their announcements of support a little bit late in the day, some perhaps you could say lukewarm endorsements coming via their social media channels later in the day. So those two are clearly perhaps on manoeuvres. The Telegraph reporting particularly about Mr Sunak this morning, and he chose not to be at Westminster yesterday. So yes, you know, what sort of administration would either of those um, deliver? You know, we know Liz Truss is perhaps more on the right of the party. Mr Sunak's instincts perhaps are more fiscally conservative than Mr Johnson has been. That has big implications for things like the budget, things like spending. And that's when the markets, of course, might actually pay a little bit more attention. What would you do with, with the Brexit situation right now, Stephanie? I mean, again, you know, we're talking about Liz Truss saying she could trigger Article 16, but it's not really seeping into the markets right now. No, and I think this is because it's a bit of a boy who cried wolf situation we've got, right? We had over and over Frost talking about triggering Article 16. It looked like the, it was, the stage was set to do it after COP, and then it didn't happen. And that, I think, reflects how much the decision to trigger Article 16 is dependent on domestic political calculations. And crucially, while Truss's 
kind of views matter, it's ultimately Johnson. And, you know, supposedly part of why Frost stepped down was because he felt that Johnson wouldn't have the stomach to kind of move forward with triggering Article 16 and going out in that more aggressive path. So again, I think it comes to what is Johnson going to choose is politically expedient for him domestically. That's what's going to influence it. I think for investors, it's just exhausting trying to guess what that will be. One one week yeah. we have an announcement that says Article 16 will be triggered. The next, they're in constructive negotiations again. And that can just, I think, get a bit boring and exhausting for investors to track. Yeah, Stephanie, I mean, what's also exhausting and almost impossible to track is, do, do you think party gate, I mean, you mentioned that Boris Johnson could possibly resign you know, later in the year. Do you think party gate is it? I mean, he's had a pretty remarkable, resilient career, you know, career political career with a, a lot of downs. So, honestly, I kind of agree that I struggle to see Boris Johnson himself resigning. I think it becomes more a question of when do you get critical mass among Conservative MPs. So, as David obviously mentioned, you need 54 MPs to come forward. So it's not enough for just the Douglas Rosses of the world, who doesn't have, like, a notoriously great relationship with Johnson. Uh, it's not enough for people like that. You'd have to see a more widespread pushback. And that's where things like Brexit actually really come into it. Because if the ERG, for example, are dissatisfied with the way the Brexit negotiations are going, or if there's a sense that, you know, they're not being hard enough, you could start to see the pressure build up there. It's funny, we talked about the kind of <laughs> the issues around wine and cheese parties before Christmas within the Institute. And we were saying, if he can just avoid some more scandals, he might be able to kind of, you know, batten down the hatches for January, February, March, and see how the local elections go, stem the losses. But instead, what we've got is yet another scandal. I think that's what's increasingly hard to weather for Tory MPs who are supporting Johnson because he's supposed to be the popular prime minister. And that makes yeah. him uniquely, I think, vulnerable. Thank you both for joining us. Sir David Merritt, of course, our news director, and Stephanie Kelly, deputy head of Aberdeen's Research Institute. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on politics throughout the day. We'll look at France next with elections looming for Emmanuel Macron. Also, the Chinese property firm Sunak takes a tumble as it faces more pressure due to its debts. More on the pain in China's property sector. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, some of China's biggest banks are reportedly becoming more selective about funding real estate projects. The latest Chinese property firm to come under the pressure of their huge debt piles is Sunak China. Its shares slumped by a record 20% in Hong Kong after its $580 million share sale failed to restore investor confidence. Now, some of China's most stressed builders need to make a raft of key payments this week. Well, we're back with Stephanie Kelly, deputy head of Aberdeen's Risha. Institute. Stephanie, how worried are you about China and the fact that the markets seem to be shrugging off some of the concerns that we could be seeing in China in the next 12 months? I think China has a couple of, of challenges. They're pretty well known, though. The first is clearly just around how you manage a zero COVID policy against the backdrop of, of Omicron, a much more in, infectious and, and easily spread version of, of the COVID virus. So I think that's that's the first that naturally makes the growth outlook more challenging because it implies more frequent, more extensive restrictions on movement and activity, which obviously has knockout implications then potentially for other markets, given the role that China plays as a major exporter to the world. I think the other then is around the broader regulatory backdrop, which clearly in 2021, yep. investors were introduced to some of the challenges that come with um, a very significant emerging market grappling with regulatory changes that need to take place and indeed trying to balance not just the kind of market side but also crucially we know that in China the importance of social cohesion and social stability that slightly alters the calculation when it comes to the regulatory space versus the more kind of capitalist liberal economies. Stephanie, is it really all about inflation also in China because if we have a more accommodative PBOC then it makes it easier for the rest of the world to manage? Well I think it's Honestly, when you think about the kind of global picture and the conversations we're having around China, it tends to actually, interestingly, be less around Chinese inflation and more around Chinese restrictions and the role of key ports in terms of export restrictions on movement, particularly with such a highly infectious variant and a tendency to lock down. That can have really interesting supply implications, which then impact the rest of the world in terms of the, the kind of Mm -hmm. uh, in-country effects that they can have, but it doesn't tend to be as, as kind of direct as you might imagine.
So, uh, Stephanie, what does it mean for investors? Is there anything, you know, e either exposure of, of big companies like equities to China that you would be snapping up right now, or do you just do a pure play, for example, with Renminbi? So I think actually what's interesting for investors is really understanding the nuance in China, right? It's not as simple. Sometimes there can be a tendency to kind of, you know, you get asked questions like, is China going to collapse? And these kind of very kind of black or white questions. Is China screaming by? Whereas instead, our view is very much that China is a complex, very large, very complex economy where you need to have extremely high kind of quality and insight on the ground and a bottom-up perspective. And that's the approach we try to make. We try and match this kind of very into in-depth macro geopolitical research that we do with on the ground bottom-up investing mm -hmm. and that allows us to access opportunities more more readily and be nimble and, and be able to move right. and react to the regulatory and economic environment all right stephanie thanks so much we'll get you back on to really pin it down on some of these investments that you're talking about stephanie kelly the deputy head of aberdeen's research institute now coming up uk-based meal box subscription service gusto has raised funding we'll talk about valuation and possible ipo this is bloomberg inflation hits a four-decade high. James Bullard now sees four rate hikes in 2022. Boris Johnson buys time. The UK Prime Minister apologizes before Parliament, but dismisses calls for his resignation. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we talk to the UK-based unicorn Gusto. The meal kit service secures $100 million funding from SoftBank. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. The market's all about inflation. Today, we also have some PPI print. Yesterday, it was interesting to see that inflation was much maybe broader than expected. And then I'm seeing a lot of opinion pieces today looking at the difference between equities and bonds we've been talking about the discrepancy in this uh, for quite some time but the fact that bond market traders are maybe looking at a set of numbers which point to a recovery which is sluggish like they had in finance after the financial crisis but actually the recovery could come roaring back now the biggest annual gain in u.s inflation nearly four decades all but guarantees a series of rate hikes by the fed this year minneapolis fed president neil kashkari says he's confident that inflation will return to two percent in the long term if you look at financial market indicators of where do financial markets think inflation is going over the long term over the long term they're solidly in the camp that inflation is going back to historical levels of around two percent so that's i mean i don't overweight that that's one data point that we pay attention to but that at least gives us some confidence and the dollar after that underperformed all of its G10 appears as traders moved beyond a recent preoccupation with hedging the speed and intensity of futures U.S. rate hikes, but really betting on this rate liftoff from the Fed March by latest. Now to company news and UK based meal kit service Gusto says it has raised $100 million from SoftBank and another $50 million in new debt capital from HSBC and Barclays. The company says a funding round gives a unicorn a $1.7 billion valuation, a big increase from its November 2020 round, which valued it at $1 billion. But with some of its peers like HelloFresh and Blue Apron facing headwinds, can Gusto actually justify its heady numbers? Well, to help us answer that, I'm joined by Timo Bolt, Gusto's founder and chief executive. Timo, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on your recent round of funding. Is there a barrier to entry to what you're doing, or is your biggest concern that you could have another rival coming in, cheaper, better products, and actually will really hurt your proposition? So the barriers to entry are really low, but the barriers to scale are enormous. And today I'm hugely proud Gusto is offering the lowest price point, 40% better convenience, twice as much choice on the menu as the closest competitor. And so we'll push the boundary. We've got 500 people soon in our technology and data team to create moat uh, and, and make it amazing for customers. But ultimately, there are 67 million people in the UK eating lunch and dinner every single day of the week. That's 1 billion meal occasions. And so our share yeah. of stomach is under 1%. Yeah, so how big can you get? And is your biggest concern, I mean, you've had, you know, some pretty good money in, in terms of fundraising. You need to get big quite quickly to make sure that the supply chain, that you focus on sustainability and, and really scale up like a lot of the American startups do very quickly. 
I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're trading on a couple of hundred million in, in revenue. We are profitable. We're very purpose driven. Every single time you buy Gusto, seven kilos of CO2 emissions are taken out of the system compared to going to the supermarket. And so I feel really proud of what the team has already achieved. And now we use the additional funding. Uh, and by the way, the round has been hugely oversubscribed. We could have raised so much more money, but we don't need more money. We are profitable. Um, but it will serve as a catalyst, investing more into AI-driven factories, automation, you know, and giving customers even better value. That's what I obsess. It's not so much scale. It's yeah. this kind of what value can we deliver to customers. Um, Timo, at the end of the day, do you want to IPO or would you actually be bought up by another company that, you know, that would like to have that UK exposure, which maybe they don't have? Like, is your biggest rival someone in the US right now? That's that's not on my radar at all. If I'm honest, my you know vision is to be the most loved way to eat dinner, and the purpose is to build amazing products that have positive impact on people and the planet. I feel privileged for us as a team to be on this mission yeah. for the next 10, 20 years. And so, if an IPO serves the means of making this even better for customers, will IPO. But there's no plan at this point to IPO. We're fully funded. We are profitable, you know, shareholders are happy, everyone is happy, the, the vision, the strategy is locked in. And so it's all about creating value for customers, really. So uh, how much do you worry about supply chains? And this has everything to do from, of course, inflation, where you source some of the products, which could cut, for example, some of the margins of the medium people uh, that are doing the transition. But also, in general, that could give you a much stronger control on sustainability. Well, the first point to make is I'm hugely proud of us charging from 298, including free delivery to shop across all of the UK. It's mind boggling value for money and, and you know, less than anyone in the world is charging for what we're offering. And so I'm really proud of that. We so far have not raised any prices. And we have the ability, given our algorithms, you know, we have 6,000 recipes and then we have an algorithm that tells us what actually goes onto the menu. You know, we can absorb yeah. swings in supply chain and inflation quite easily by trading the menu in a very dynamic way. And so, so far, you know, of course, it's been challenging given labor shortages uh, and supply chain issues. But, but I would say, you know, we're fairly positive about it. Yeah, are you expecting actually the labor shortage in the UK to get easier? And is this really a product of COVID or Brexit? I, I think there's a lot of protectionism. You know, I am a foreigner. I've lived in the UK for 13 years. I've got a British passport. For the last 40 years, the brand of the UK has been around open borders, letting people come to the UK, create, you know, uh, startups, businesses. In the most recent couple of years, we have shifted towards protectionism. Uh, you know, we saw Brexit as an event. And so all of a sudden, we're seeing a, a sharp decrease in the inflow of, of people coming here. And that is certainly a big medium to long term concern. Um, Dimo, in doing research, you know, it, people say that actually one of your biggest concerns or some of them have switched, for example, to goose to another provider was really, you know, the shortages of some ingredients and some regular substitutions because of the challenges you were just pointing out. When are you expecting those pressure points to ease off? I think we are at this inflection point. We saw a spike in challenges in the second half of last year. Since then, we have a, seen a very steady kind of decrease in supply chain issues. And so the reliability of the supply chain has dramatically improved, and it's been a short-term hiccup in the supply chain. And so I feel very confident that we're leaving that behind us. Um, and we're, we're kind of taking the learnings on board. We profoundly apologize to, to you know, each customer. The error rate is fantastic. It's still very low. NPS is hugely high. Um, but we accept yeah. that you know, we don't always get it right, sending fresh ingredients across the UK. All right, Timo, thank you so much for a good conversation. Come back really soon for an update. Timo Bolt, their Gusto's founder and chief executive. Coming up, record issuance of global ESG debt doubled in 2021 as investors race to pile in. So could we hit a new peak in 2022? We'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm from Sinakwe here in London. Now, Lucid Motors, the Tesla rival partly owned by the Saudi Arabia Foreign Wealth Fund, will open a Saudi EV factory by 2026. The chairman, who's also an advisor to the PIF and on Aramco's board, spoke to Bloomberg about his ambitions in Europe and the Middle East. We're working very closely with the Ministry of Investment. Um, they've obviously got a real program around automotive and the Ministry of Industry in cooperation with the Ministry of Investment has been negotiating with us. We've announced our intent. Um, we are working very hard on you know, what percentage will be owned directly by us versus partners. But look, um, 2025, 2026, so that type of time frame. Would you say that it's getting a bit more momentum? Is that part of the reason that you're here? It's part of the reason. I mean, I, I'm here uh, for lots of reasons. I'm always you know, my PIF role, my Aramco role. Um, but Lucid, and it's our ambitions here, uh, we're three years in the making. Um, and now that we are successfully producing and selling cars in the U.S., our attention is turning to this factory here. Lucid has also ambitious, ambitious goals for deliveries. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of supply chain constraints that might hold back some of those goals? Yeah, as I mentioned uh, in the pre um, to interview. I, I'm in a quiet period, so I can't talk about numbers at all. Uh, but I will say to you that, you know, if you think about when we first said we'd be producing to this very moment, um, we have had a start of production successfully in October. And, you know, we've got our prototypes and now our cars are being delivered. I'm the recipient of one. At, I want to tell you, I bought it at market price. Okay. It's in Florida. It's a phenomenal car. And I, I'm not saying that because I'm chairman. It is a phenomenal car. And I would tell you that we'll, we'll have a lot more to say to the market about the sorts of things we're seeing on the supply chain. But yes, we're experiencing supply chain issues. Where does the European market sort of fit into the global pie? Because just early on in the month, uh, there was an announcement around that. Yeah, retail in Europe, uh, for sure, you know, right-hand drive and, you know, how we uh, eventually get to UK. But certainly uh, continental Europe is one of our key markets. R remember, our first car is uh, a luxury car. It's a it's at the high end, and it's a, it's a beautiful car, uh, but it's up against Mercedes and Audi and BMW and Porsche. And what we have going for us is our range, 525 miles EPA certified, um, and that, frankly, beats everyone. And, you know, our ambitions in Europe are very strong as well in terms of retail. Uh, we've said nothing about factories yet in Europe. Well, that was Andrew Liveris, the chairman of Lucid Motors, speaking to us at the Mineral Summit in Riyadh. Now, sustainable debt sales more than doubled to $1.6 trillion last year for the first time ever. The jump has been driven by green bonds, sustainability-linked loans, and countries selling ESG offerings. As investors race now to buy ESG debt, we could see issuance hit a new peak in 2022. So to talk about this market, we're joined by Kay Hope, credit research analyst at Bank of America. Kay, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, the interesting thing with issuance is that we are expecting overall ESG debt issuance to increase, but what if some of the labels that have been green so far get reissued? Is that the biggest concern to this part of the market in 2022? Our expectation is really for more, more, more. Uh, more green bonds, more social bonds, more sustainability bonds, and a, and a lot of growth in sustainability-linked uh, bonds and loans. The reason for that is the labels, different labels are offering different advantages for issuers. So Social bonds have really created a space for supranationals, where green bonds have the broadest appeal. Um, Sustainability-linked bonds and loans allow a company who may not have 100% of proceeds to use on green or social projects to use the proceeds as they wish, but still sort of plant their ESG flag and show their commitment to improving on given KPIs. Right. So, Kate, okay, what new products, you know, sustainability link loans or bonds, might actually leave investors a little bit more cautious so that they don't go into greenwashing, which is everyone's biggest scare? I really think greenwashing as an overall theme is going to be big in 2022. Investors are looking more and more closely at ESG. They really want to understand how a company plans to use its proceeds, whether it's general corporate purposes or in the case of a green or social or sustainability bond, where all proceeds must be used for green or social projects. People really want to know what those projects are because one person's greenwashing may not match another's. And so we really expect people to be taking, taking that ESG on board even more in 22 than what we saw last year.
And Kay, there's a part of the market which so far is unregulated, the ESG derivative and repo markets. Is that a product area that you'd be looking at that could go, you know, grow more? And are there any risks associated with that development? I think the repo and derivatives markets are also expected to grow. At the same time, they're also going to be coming under greater scrutiny, regulations or not. You know, ESG scores also are not regulated, but there are increasing demands for, for scrutiny in those areas too. Um, okay, how does ESG actually change the cost of capital overall? This is something that's really interesting, and we've done some work on this, particularly on the fixed income side. And what we're seeing is everything from a small greenium or a, a pricing premium with things like green bonds, which can be a couple of basis points or up to, up to 10, 15, 20 basis points in the high yield space. And that's because of greater demand for the label. But we also see changes in cost of capital creeping up in conventional bonds, which I think is really, really interesting. And we wrote a report on this late last year where we looked at things like oil and gas and tobacco, which are areas where our investors have told us they're more likely to reduce exposures over the next three years. And sort of reflecting that, especially in oil and gas, we've seen less issuance of 10 years or longer in the past 12 to 24 months. And we're also seeing that coupons have been pretty flat um, across oil and gas new deals in 2020 and 2021. And that's interesting because oil prices doubled in 2021. So you would think that the cash flows associated with that would make those coupons go down, where in fact that yeah. wasn't what we saw. And, and we see similar things in tobacco as well. Yeah, and, and Kay, that really actually caught my attention, right? The fact that ESG you know, is impacting some of the conventional bond spreads. And actually in your research, you know, and I think you also point to the fact that, you know, new issuance will be, you know, higher, so more expensive. New issuance of labeled bonds we do expect to continue to increase. So you're right, we had about a trillion dollars equivalent last year across across the four key labels. Um, we We do expect that to grow substantially in 2022 particularly as so far what we've seen globally is different parts of the world are using the different labels in slightly different ways, which may kind of cross-pollinate across regions to give um, investors in, in sectors ideas of, of doing something similar to what someone in Europe did or someone in Asia has done. So I think there's a lot of room to grow, and our U.S. Uh, counterparts have not really gotten on board yet in terms of labeled mm -hmm. issuance. Okay, thanks so much. Kay Hope, they're a credit research analyst at Bank of America, joining us this morning to talk about ESG. Now, let's get straight to a Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Garens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Tesco has joined rival grocer Sainsbury's in raising its profit forecast after solid online sales during the Christmas season. The UK's biggest supermarket reported sales across the group during the festive period up by 3.2%. That's on top of strong comparable sales from last year. London kept up a blistering pace of technology financing last year, leading all other European cities with $25.5 billion in fresh investment. And according to a report from the capital's promotional company, London & Partners, tech funding was more than double the level of 2020. London ranked fourth for VC investments among urban areas around the world, trading the San Francisco Bay Area, New York and Boston. TSMC has reported better than expected profit aided by voracious demand for its semiconductors that power everything from TVs to cars. The Taiwanese chipmaker says net income for the December quarter rose 16% to a record of $6 billion. Asia's most valuable company has been racing to meet demand with heavy investment in new plants, including in Japan and the US. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, coming up, Gold gains. The precious metal is near a one-week high, boosted by the inflation surge. So we'll have plenty more on that next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics, markets. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We have it all covered. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we also look at geopolitics. It's been a very big week for relations between the U.S., the EU, and, of course, Russia. And after those talks in NATO, we also had, of course, a lot of talks not only on Kazakhstan but Ukraine. Uh, we heard a couple of minutes ago from the Kremlin that they think the talks with the U.S. at NATO this week were unsuccessful. So we'll keep an eye on that and the impact it has on energy prices. Also, U.S. CPI showing the biggest annual gain in nearly four decades. Given that information in advance, many investors would have opted for gold, a metal celebrated for its ability to hedge inflation through history. Well, let's get straight to our Bloomberg MLive editor, Eddie van der Valt. Eddie, I have many questions on, on that inflation print and whether you think it's very broad. But with inflation running so hot, a lot of people would have sought shelter in gold. But now there's a bit of a play also with cryptocurrency. Is this the hedge against inflation? Yeah, you know what? Gold did well yesterday, but I think that was more a reaction to the dollar doing well. Um, uh, so, sorry, the dollar, the dollar slipping a bit and, and, and pushing up gold prices. In fact, gold has been a really, really poor inflation hedge over the past year. It's down something like 4% in nominal terms. Um, in real terms, it's down double digits uh, over the past year, or so, at least since the beginning of uh, 20. 21. And, you know, I think people will be very disappointed by gold's performance overall. And that makes it very hard to look for shelter from inflation in this current environment. Yes. Yeah, so what's Bitcoin? I mean, are we looking at Ether or Bitcoin as, a, you know, something that will really take hold as an inflation hedge? Or are there just not enough institutional investors to call it a natural hedge? You know, I, I've been looking at this data really hard. And, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's hard to make the case for, for, for Bitcoin as an inflation hedge because it just really has no correlation with real rates. It just, it just doesn't track tips. It ta tracks the Nasdaq more than anything else. But over time, there's no, there's no, there's no question that uh, Bitcoin purchasing power has risen. So it, I, I suppose it depends on over what time frame you consider Bitcoin. If you're looking at a really short time frame, not really a good inflation hedge. If you look at it from 2012, you know, it's back in 2012, it bought half a barrel of oil per Bitcoin. Now it buys something like a thousand. So, you know, Bitcoin's purchasing power certainly has increased. Whether we call that a, a store of wealth or an inflation hedge, I'm not sure. Um, Eddie, let's also look at Pound. I mean, a lot is being talked about Pound despite some trouble for Boris Johnson. On the party front, uh, markets actually discounting volatility in, in the UK, and that's probably a reaction of the BOE being up front. So, certainly, Boris got himself into trouble with his party because of parties. So, uh, you know, I think... I think the market is somewhat discounting the, the, the risk of Boris Johnson uh, actually facing a serious challenge here. We don't really have evidence that that is on the cards just yet. And I think that's part of the reason why the pound is sanguine. Also, very hard to see how it plays out because, you know, even if we do get a different leader, do we get a change in policy in the UK? So how do you play the pound? Do we perhaps get a more prudent uh, prime minister? Do we get better relationships with the EU? But all of those are hypotheticals based on the question of whether Boris faces a serious challenge and that's not on the cards yet so you know for the moment i don't think that's a, that's the major driver for the pound eddie thank you so much eddie van der Valt, so nice to see you back in the studio actually you are now the proud dad of a self-sufficient puppy rufus self-sufficient certainly thank yeah, you there you go with all of our market action now bloomberg surveillance early edition continues in the next hour matt miller and kaylee lines are in new york and edwards here in london this is bloomberg The question is not, is the Fed going to be hawkish or not? It's more, can the Fed still surprise on the hawkish side? The Fed is operating independently, and the president has underscored the importance of the Fed operating independently. To say the Fed's behind the curve is uh, putting it uh, very kindly. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, January 13th, our top stories today. The Fed's countdown to liftoff. Two Fed presidents join those calling for interest rate hikes as soon as March. Inflation is job number one. President Biden's choice for Fed Vice Chair Leo Brainard calls the battle against rising prices the most important task for the central bank. Meanwhile, the president says the administration is making progress despite new figures showing inflation at a four-decade high.
and TSMC will spend its way out of the global chip shortage. Apple's most important chip maker raises its revenue outlook and earmarks up to $44 billion to expand capacity. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger, stepping in for Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Kaylee, the hottest CPI reading since the early 1980s. Not much of a reaction yesterday, but this trading session kicking off with a little bit of weakness. Yeah, I think it raises a question of how much that data was already priced in and how much potentially a March liftoff by the Fed was already priced in. But to your point, Danny, it was a pretty red session in Asia overnight. You had stocks down in Japan, Hong Kong, and China. But there's two specific sectors that I want to point to one being technology the Hang Seng Tech Index down about one and three quarters of a percent giving back a large chunk of the gains it saw in the Wednesday session and the other is the property sector a Bloomberg intelligence gauge of Chinese property developers fell about 4.3 percent overnight and that is on news that some banks in China are being more selective about funding real estate projects backed by local government financing vehicles so that is weighing heavily on that sector and one stock in particular really underperformed and that was Sunak of course a heavily indebted troubled property developer. Those shares fell more than 20%, a record drop overnight after a $580 million sale uh, to shore up liquidity. And then finally, I would just point to the Japanese yen stronger against the dollar for a second day. Right now, the dollar weaker by about a tenth of 1%. We're looking around a 14 handle, but of course, broadly, it has been a weaker dollar story over the last two days, Matt. Yeah, we have seen uh, the weakness in the dollar really persist through um, currencies. It's interesting to see the euro, for example, and I'm sure Danny's going to show us in just a second, go up to 114, finally breaking out of that range. S&P futures right now unchanged, uh, and we did see gains yesterday, about three-tenths of 1%, so that inflation number didn't jar markets then. The U.S. 10-year yield coming up a little bit at 175.18. This makes the dollar doubly interesting because as we see yields rise, we continue to see the dollar fall. The Bloomberg Dollar Index in November at 11.90, uh, right now at 11.64. So really coming off of the highs that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And then Bitcoin rising, actually going up through 44,000 yesterday, um, overnight I should say, after the inflation print came out. Now letting off a little bit, but still at 43. 3,936. Danny, what do you see in Europe? Well, it's a lot of divergence in these European regional benchmarks. There's no one clear theme. For example, you have Italy, the FTSE MIB, that's higher by two tenths of one percent. Spain, IBEX, up three tenths of one percent. Overall, it does translate into a weaker benchmark because you have some of these really large cap momentum stocks that are selling off in the Cacaron, in the DAX, DAX lower by about one tenth of one percent. There still is a little twinge of a value type flavor to today's trading Ooh, session, twinge. which we've seen really throughout. <laughs> yes, twinge throughout the past week or so. So that's really continuing on today. But as I said, it means our benchmark for the stock 600 is weaker today, despite calls for it to outperform, given its shorter duration exposure than, say, U.S. equities. We're looking at a pound, Matt. You mentioned the strong dollar. Kaylee, you did as well. One of the places we're really seeing it play out, Matt, I know you wanted me to show the euro, but I'm more interested in sterling today. The cable rate up by <laughs> three-tenths of a percent, just nearly. This is significant because we have a lot of political issues issues in the UK. Boris Johnson facing tough questions about his action at the height of the first lockdown. That not feeding through into the currency. Instead, it's easing restrictions when it comes to travel in the UK between Europe and lower COVID cases that seem to be allowing this to outperform. Earnings really color the rest of this market. Technology is outperforming after that very strong read from TSMC. The chip makers in Europe also leading gains today. And Marks and Spencers, this is a grocer here in the UK. One of the biggest decliners in the stock six the bar is so high for grocers right now. Kaylee, they did really well during the COVID period, but Marks and Spencer's upgraded, but not enough, according to analysts. Yeah, a Jeffrey's analyst actually saying that they have a challenge backdrop, backdrop due to supply chain pressures, Danny. Something we've exactly. heard a lot and something mm. I think we'll be hearing a lot this earnings season, which of course kicks off in earnest in the U.S. tomorrow. But as for what's ahead today, talks on Ukraine's crisis will continue with the OC. OSCE meeting in Vienna. Then coming up at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, we will get U.S. PPI data. Producer level price pressures will likely peak in the first quarter, but of course this follows the seven handle we got on CPI yesterday. And then at 10 a.m. New York time, the Senate Banking Committee will hold a hearing on Leo Brainerd's nomination for Federal Reserve Vice Chair. In prepared remarks, Brainerd says that curbing inflation is the central bank's most important task. And while we wait to hear more from Brainerd later today, we've heard from a chorus of Federal Reserve speakers over the last 
last several days. St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard now looking for four rate hikes in 2022. He's part of a growing chorus of presidents opening the door to a hike in March, including Patrick Harker of Philadelphia, Mary Daly of San Francisco, Loretta Mester of Cleveland, and Raphael Bostic of Atlanta. Joining us now is Christina Kino, who helps lead our markets coverage. So, Christina, it seems pretty clear that the Fed is trying to telegraph something here. Is there anywhere in the market that is not priced for March liftoff? Well, Kaylee, I think what's interesting in terms of how markets are taking this is really that dollar yields divergence that Matt was pointing out earlier. And it's raising a lot of questions because, you know, as we saw that repricing in Fed rate expectations at the start of this year, we've not seen the dollar follow through. In fact, it's languishing near its lowest level since about late November. And I think that's really throwing up questions over the implications of what we're seeing now in terms of the Fed sea change. And what does it actually mean for four rate hikes or potentially more uh, in 2022? What would that mean in terms of uh, how that would hit the consumer, how that would hit long term economic growth, especially after CPI's, the CPI number yesterday uh, showed that real wages in particular have been very, very much hit. I think we're negative on real wages now for more than a year. And so that's going to be uh, really weighing on the consumer and potentially factoring into the dollar reaction. Action here. Yeah, it is fascinating, this dollar story. Another fascinating story to try to wrap our heads around is a continued flattening yield curve. Okay, if peak hawkishness is priced in, what is a yield curve that cannot find its way any steeper telling us? Well, Danny, I think it tells us two things. Um, one is the fact that the yield curve as a signal of economic growth and other things is potentially broken at this mm -hmm. stage. I mean, we've had lots of discussions over the various factors that have structurally changed uh, what the yield curve could tell us. And I think number two is, is also just this idea of it, the question of how far really yields could go in this sort of environment. I mean, we have seen that run up higher in uh, U.S. Treasury yields across the curve, yes, but as you know, we've, we've mentioned, there are still a lot of structural factors keeping those yields in check and perhaps uh, a bit fall, further behind in terms of the, the move in yields as, as well compared to, for instance, the Fed terminal rate, which is about 2.5% mm. according to Fed estimates. Yeah, the bond Market trying to make sense of future monetary policy and inflationary forces. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Christine Aquino. Now, speaking of inflation, President Biden says his administration is making progress battling rising prices as U.S. inflation hit a near 40 year high in December. National Economic Council Director Brian Deese told Bloomberg that Biden has faith in the Fed to use its tools to fight higher prices. Take a listen. They're continuing to predict that we'll see an easing in price uh, increases in price pressures over the course of 2022. The president has underscored the importance of the Fed operating independently to make uh, to take actions uh, consistent with making sure that these price increases do don't become entrenched. For more on the politics of inflation, we're joined now by Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter in Washington. So, Jack, clearly the Biden administration has been dogged by inflation for some time. It has faith in the Fed to fight it, but we don't even know yet what Biden wants the Fed to look like ultimately. There's still three vacant seats that he has yet to put forward nominees for. How does this inflation fight color who he selects for those seats? Well, it, it hasn't become clear yet exactly how that's going to filter down to the uh, selections the president makes on, on other seats. But clearly, it is a, a really high priority, not only for the president, uh, but we know that in Lyle Brainerd's uh, hearing today at the Senate Banking Committee, she's going to play up the importance uh, and say that getting back down to a 2 percent rate of inflation is the most important goal she has. Uh, and that comes from someone on, on the more liberal end of the spectrum who has also emphasized in the past the need uh, to look at full employment and, and wage gains and, and other things that go ar around full employment beyond just the unemployment rate itself. So clearly it has really dominated the conversation both when you hear from the president on the state of the economy and is going to be a, a main focus in the hearing coming up today. And that is uh, I think obviously something we can expect senators to follow up on is exactly uh, what the Fed's actions look like over the next year and, and how they get uh, and how quickly they get back down uh, to something closer to a 2% Jack, rate. Jack, probably much more important for Washington. We could have an hour special on whether getting rid of the filibuster is a good mm -hmm. idea, right? It must feel good right now, but it could hurt a lot in 2023. Are they going to do that to get this voting rights legislation through?
Uh, talking to the more moderate senators, there's not support for uh, just getting rid of the 60 vote uh, filibuster threshold. There have been conversations around making it more difficult so that it has to be a talking filibuster rather than today we essentially have a preemptive filibuster and a preemptive need for 60 votes to hold the final vote on passage. Uh, there are conversations about uh, coming up with some sort of change and the president is going to speak today to the Senate Democratic Caucus about that. He has taken an aggressive tone on this, uh, but when you hear from moderates, Joe Manchin or even uh, John Tester from Montana, the, the changes they're talking about making, if they can get all the Democrats to support it, would be something uh, more slight along the lines of a talking filibuster or uh, uh, changing it for procedural votes, but still leaving in 60 votes uh, for the final uh, mm. end to debate in the Senate. All right, Jack, thank you very much. That's Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government. Now to Apple's most important chip maker. TSMC's latest results blew past estimates for profit powered by demand for iPhones, cars, and TVs. Debbie Wu, Bloomberg Asia tech reporter, joins us now from Taipei. Debbie, what really stood out to me in these earnings is $44 billion of potential capital ex expenditures from TSMC. What does that tell us about their confidence in the future? So uh, the uh, executives in today's earnings call said that they are very confident about their uh, outlook. And so that's why uh, they are spending uh, uh, this record amount, well, basically are uh, outspending uh, uh, their rivals uh, or uh, their frenemy Intel and uh, even uh, governments in uh, trying to uh, create more capacity. And then uh, uh, so the uh, 44 uh, billion uh, spending will still be most focused on uh, uh, increasing uh, capacity at uh, advanced node, that is uh, cutting edge chips for uh, uh, high performance computing, including uh, chips that go into uh, servers, and then uh, uh, for uh, GPUs that are uh, used in uh, gaming, and also uh, chips for uh, Apple's devices like uh, MacBooks and iPhones. Yo, you know, speaking about chips, uh, we have another home run indicator from Bloomberg Economics. Yesterday I showed you the GDP tracker, which was pretty sick, and a lot of people writing in asking how to get that off the Bloomberg. Um, today I'll show you the U.S. supply constraint indicator. Actually, Bloomberg Economics has put together supply constraint indicators for the U.S., Europe, and the U.K. What they all show us, Debbie, and those of you listening on Bloomberg Radio, is that we saw the constraints peak in the summer of last year. And now they've come off a little bit into 2022. The concern is, Debbie, that Omicron and the slowdowns in China really drive the constraints back up. So that is indeed one concern. What we are seeing in China, the uh, uh, global factory that uh, makes everything from uh, your uh, computers, smartphones, and then toys, is uh, uh, battling with uh, new emergence of uh, Omicron. And then we have seen uh, China imposing uh, lockdowns in a number of cities, and including uh, in uh, uh, Tianjin, a, a major port city. And then uh, the situation in Tianjin actually has uh, forced uh, Toyota to close their uh, plants earlier this week, mm -hmm. and it still remains closed. And the latest mm -hmm. That just came in is that Volkswagen's uh, production in uh, Tianjin is has also been uh, affected. So that sort of uh, disruptions in uh, the supply chain and production could mean that uh, uh, we could see uh, inflation uh, easily uh, going uh, back up again, and then uh, probably we may expect some uh, uh, supply chain uh, bottlenecks to appear yeah. later on uh, should the uh, yeah. Omicron situation worsen in China. Yeah, China's COVID zero policy could have ripple effects throughout the entire global economy. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Debbie Wu. And speaking of COVID-19 and the fight against it, it is affecting some stocks moving in pre-market trading in the U.S. this morning. One big mover to the upside being Adagio Therapeutics. It's a COVID-19 monoclonal, monoclonal monoclonal antibody monoclonal. treatment, if I can get my words out. Not the easiest word to say when it comes to some of these biopharma things, but it actually showed efficacy fighting against the Omicron variant. And as a result, that stock is up about 22% before the bell. Omicron, Matt, yes, you are entirely correct. <laughs> Another mover to the upside in that same vein is Veer Biotechnology. It already is up about 20% over the last two days after the U.S. government ordered an under, another 600,000 doses of its antibody treatment. It's up another 6.2% in early hours this morning. One mover to the 
downside, though, is Elastic. It's a software company. It announced a new CEO overnight. Its CEO and founder getting moved down to the chief technology officer position, a position and investors don't really seem to like that management shakeup. That stock is down about 5.5% before the bell, Danny. Kaylee, a two for one. Not only do we get pre-market movers, but also a lesson in medical pronunciation. <laughs> All right, coming up, Goldman Sachs clients join the course of bullish calls for Europe. We're going to be speaking with Sharon Bell, senior European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. And dented demand. We're going to weigh the impact of Omicron on oil's, on oil's high prices, plus get boosted or get out. How Wall Street is tackling the return to the office amid Omicron. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Danny Berger filling in for Anna Edwards in London. And we are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. We are talking a lot about rates because of the amazing moves that we saw last week and because of the fact that so many, Kaylee was saying earlier, a chorus of uh, Fed members have come out and said, we really need to get ahead of inflation. We even heard from Jim Bullard that he thinks we're now gonna see four hikes this year, um, basically agreeing with the uh, Goldman Sachs, Jan Hatzius forecast. Now, one of the problems is um, we've seen such a huge issuance for high yield debt, and there's still a lot to come, but these rate hikes make it more difficult. This is the average new issue concession just jumping as we see rate hike expectations rise. I think nine basis points. Let's bring in Donna L. Baltaji, our managing editor for credit in EMEA, and ask her, Donna, um, is this new hiking cycle going to hurt issuance going forward? Uh, absolutely, and that's why we're seeing a massive flood of issuance this week. In fact, we're just a few hundred million short of a weekly record here in Europe. It is incredible. The market is extremely hot. You know, one of the reasons why it's so hot is that the market actually closed early last year because of Omicron. I think I said that right. And <laughs> for that reason, there's a lot of issuance that was ha that, that was that was meant to happen at the end of last year that is actually happening now. But also, with when you look at um, the issuers. As far as they're concerned, borrowing costs are still very cheap. They're still about 80 basis points off of the average of what they have been paying over the last five years. So for that reason, this is a fantastic time to be hitting the market. Donna, don't worry. If you if you mispronounce that, I'm sure Matt Matt will let you know. So you did a fine job there. <laughs> I do wonder what you also make of the supply demand dynamics when it comes to sovereign debt issuance. Uh, we look at a lot of governments increasing their spending, especially here in Europe. How does that dynamic play into the picture? We're seeing still a lot of demand. You know, Ireland is in the market today. It's got 30 billion uh, euros of um, orders for its debt. Cyprus is doing very well. We had some other sales this year. The demand for sovereign debt is still quite high. Um, however, the demand for your for Euro corporate bonds is higher. You are seeing more and more investors that are demanding uh, more uh, uh, company bonds. And for that reason, the the companies are obliging. Um, we aren't seeing as many sovereign issuers in the market, but we are seeing more companies. And that's basically mm. the dynamic for this year. Donna, thank you so much. That's our Donna El Baltaji, Managing Editor for Credit in EMEA. And for more market analysis, check out MLiveGo on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. now for your first word news and in the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson bought himself some time with an apology for attending a party at his Downing Street office during lockdown but members of his own Conservative Party are still angry making his grip on power precarious most conservative politicians who talk to Bloomberg say they will wait for the findings of an official probe Bloomberg has learned that HSBC is in talks to move its New York headquarters to a tower in Hudson Yards. It's considering a lease for roughly 250,000 square feet at the Spiral. That's a 65-story skyscraper that's being built by Tishman Speyer on Manhattan's far west side. It's set to be completed this year.
And elsewhere in Manhattan, apartment rents rose to a record last month. The median rent in New York's most expensive borough climbed 16% from a year earlier to almost $3,500. That's largely due to leases at buildings with doormen. Honestly, living in New York, I hate to see it. Now coming up, we'll get back to the market. Sharon Bell, <laughs> senior European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, will be joining us. Why she prefers Europe other over, uh, over other regions this year. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger stepping in for Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee, with Kaylee Lines and Matt Miller in New York. Here's what you need to know today. And President Biden's choice for vice chair of the Federal Reserve says that curbing inflation is the central bank's most important task. Leo Reynard said that working people around the country are concerned about how far their paychecks will go. Her Senate confirmation hearing is today. Fed Presidents Mary Daly and Patrick Harker have joined officials discussing an interest rate hike as soon as March. Harker says the Fed should act to temper consumer demand. And Blackstone is requiring its U.S. staff to get COVID booster shots to work in the office. The world's largest alternative asset manager also plans to test office workers on site three times a week. Now that's a look at what you need to know this morning. Matt, what are you looking at three ahead of the U.S. session? That's a lot. Three, three times. times. Three tests a week. That's like my wife, you know, who thinks she has COVID <laughs> every other day. I'm looking at I'm a sorry. market that is increasingly risk on. There's not a heck of a lot of movement here, but we do see S&P futures now up one-tenth of 1%. One a half hour ago, they were only up one one-hundredth of 1%. One also, all of these risk at, at, at indicators are pointing in the right direction. So U.S. yields are rising as investors feel comfortable enough to let go of the perceived safety of government debt. The U.S. dollar index continues to fall right now at 1164, and the dollar had been a bit of a risk haven during the pandemic. Bitcoin is coming back up, and we all know that Bitcoin has been acting as a risk indicator, it was actually over 44,000 overnight, and it's pretty close right now, 43,882. So we're not making a lot of movement, but at least we're all going in one direction. Kaylee, what do you see in the pre-market? Well, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening beneath the surface, including a number of stocks moving on the back of analyst recommendations, one being Match Group, of course, the online dating service. It was initiated over at Piper Sandler with an overrate rating, 160 price target. That's about 29% upside. Right now, that stock is up the better part of 3% in early hours. Halliburton also getting upgraded over at JP Morgan. That stock is up 1.6%. But you're seeing some EV companies moving to the downside, Danny. Among them, Lucid Group and Rivian. They're each down one and a quarter to one and a half percent before the bell. I have to say the individual stock story here in Europe is really dictating the pace of the market. That's why on a benchmark level, the stock 600 looks little changed. But there's a lot of dispersion within that. One of the things, the macro stories at least, certainly moving these markets, is the weaker dollar. That is translating, and not just to a weaker euro, but a weaker pound this morning. Cable up three-tenths of one percent. That's despite some political issues. Uh, the U.K. looking very deeply into what Boris Johnson was doing in March of 2020 at the strictest of lockdowns down through that session. We're also looking at a technology session here in Europe, up more than 1%, the best performing sector so far today. That's off the back of really strong TSMC earnings in Taiwan. That translates into chip makers doing really well in today's European session as well. The final earnings story, Marks & Spencer is one of the biggest laggards on the stock 600, down some 5.5%. Yes, they did upgrade their views, but the bar is so high. According to Jeffries, considering the headwinds coming into grocers, you know, don't have everyone stuck at home anymore. You also have those supply chain issues coming into the fore. So upgrading, but not as much as analysts expected. So those are some of the stock stories for Europe and a little bit weaker today. But what about the future for European equities? Well, if you look at what Goldman Sachs clients say, they are optimistic on the future of Europe. I'm looking right now at a survey for our radio audience that Goldman Sachs did at one of its most recent conferences saying, which region do you like the best in equities? 36% said that they like Europe. That is the highest of any of the regions. Well, let's bring in someone behind that survey, Sharon Bell, senior European equity strategist at Goldman. Sharon, good morning to you. So a lot of your clients like European equities, and you yourself see a 12% return on the stock 600 this year. What goes into that thinking? Yeah, absolutely. And it's unusual for clients. Um, we do this survey every year uh, with our global clients that attend our conference at the beginning of January. We had 3,000 clients at this conference, so it's a, it's a good pool, um, a large number. 
And in previous years, they've never liked Europe. Um, they've always liked either the US market or the Asian market. So it's unusual um, to see clients with a preference for Europe. And yes, absolutely, we do as well think that European equities will do relatively well this year. They've had a decade of, and a half, really, of underperforming the US. And we think the growth will be a bit stronger in Europe this year, driven by, by fiscal spend, really. So what kind of fiscal spending are we going to see in Europe? We know that here in the US, um, there's a little bit of uh, gridlock going on in Congress. Is that different on the continent? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in, in the case of the US, there was a lot of fiscal spend around the time of the worst points of the pandemic. Um, so you had a huge amount of money spent in 2020 and 2021. You had um, large amounts of checks. You had um, a, a, a huge fiscal plan. Um, and that was a great boost to GDP. In Europe, there was less fiscal spending at those worst points. So Europe had a slightly worse um, pandemic economic outcome. But I think that there's always been plans um, since 2020, really, to start a large recovery plan. But it's very much more backloaded than in the US. So we're starting to see it now. Um, so it's the recovery fund monies that are going to be spent this year and next year, particularly in southern Europe. It's also the fact that we now have a slightly more left of center government in Germany, and we expect more fiscal spend there, too. Is the divergence in central bank policies important? Is it going to be increasingly important, Sharon? Uh, I, I think that's part of it as well. Um, I mean, your commentary earlier mentioned the slightly weaker euro, um, slightly stronger dollar, and that's definitely a little bit of a help to European stocks as well. Um, if you have a, a slightly weaker euro, the European companies are big exporters. Um, they make money across the world. So um, if, you see, uh, if you see stronger, higher rates in the US, that would tend to all other things equal push up the dollar. Um, I also think that, that tightening policy in the US is because you're further through your cycle. You have a tighter labor market in the US. The idea of that policy is to slightly um, ease back on growth. Whereas in Europe, I don't think you'll see the same tightening. Well, you talked about the FX read through and on the bond market read through. I actually want to talk to you about something. One of your colleagues at Goldman Sachs, Ben Snyder, putting out a note this morning saying that he only sees limited upside for the tenure from here. And that means actually that growth stocks can do quite well. He actually said that concerns that the Fed tightening could harm economic growth would hit cyclical value stocks more so than growth stocks. And given how weighted towards growth the U.S. market is, how weighted toward tech in particular, if they can hang in there, does that not mean U.S. can continue to outperform? But I actually think that Europe and U.S. will be quite similar this year in terms yeah. of returns, So, which will be exceptionally good for Europe compared to the last decade and a half of very clear underperformance. And I agree with Ben that there, there's a little bit more upside to yields, but we have yields, I think, ending this year at about 2%. And you can see on your screen now they're about 1.7. So there's a little bit further upside to go, but we've already had a big rise in yields. Um, and eventually the U.S. economy will slow a little bit. And of course, that's going to hit some of those cyclical value areas. Um, that being all said, growth stocks are still very expensive. Um, and in Europe, there's a little bit more skew to financials and energy stocks, which are just very, very inexpensive. Um, and if yields are rising even a modest amount, particularly earlier in the year, I think that will help some of those names. So I just feel that Europe is less disadvantaged in an environment where yields are going up modestly as opposed to the last decade or so where yields were just constantly falling. And obviously, Sharon, we're getting into earnings season now, and we've spent a good deal of this show talking about inflationary pressures, continued shortages in chips, other supply chain issues stemming from China and its COVID zero policy. Are you worried at all about margins as we really get into this quarter? Or it's, beyond? it's been uh, absolutely, it's been super interesting this year. I think that's been the, one of the main concerns about, from investors is what would all these input cost pressures mean and supply chain issues too uh, for company margins. Actually, company margins through last year through 2021 were revised up constantly by the consensus. So the consensus itself started quite cautious, could see some of these costs coming through, but actually margins were revised up. Why was that the case? It was because we had a good economic recovery, a V-shaped recovery. We're expecting good growth again this year. Um, and we do think companies will be able to pass on some of those costs, yes. Having said all of that, margins have already been revised up a lot. They are now pretty much close to peak. We've had a very, very big recovery in the space of just one year. And I think from here, margins are unlikely to be revised up another further amount. I think they'll be flatter from here. And you'll have a bit of competition between good growth, which is helpful for margins and allows pricing, but those costs remaining sticky and high.
Mm. All right, Sharon, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. That's Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs, co-head of EMEA Global Invest Investment Research. Coming up, Omicron casts a shadow over oil's rebound. We're going to discuss the outlook ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, Columbia University professor and former Goldman Sachs senior investment strategist, Abby Joseph Cohn. That's at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kelly Lyons. Danny Berger is stepping in for Anna Edwards over in London. And we've been talking a lot about oil lately because we see the price continue to march higher so that NYMEX crude looks a lot like Brent in terms of its price. In fact, um, the front month contract is trading right now at 82.72 for WTI. One of the reasons is that the supply demand picture looks more and more supportive and we moved from contango into backwardation now so that the uh, out contracts are less expensive than the front month. Mike McGlone joins us from Bloomberg Intelligence. He's a commodities and cryptocurrency strategist, so we will get to Bitcoin. But Mike, I want to ask first about the incredible march higher in oil and how long you think this can last. I think it's temporary, Matt. Um, crude oil looks like it's bouncing with an enduring bear market. So that price you see on the screen, that's the same price as about 10 years ago, and it's almost 50% from the peak in 2008. So the key thing that I ask myself about crude oil is what has changed since pressured prices for the last 10 years? It's most notably North American production exceeding consumption, and that's actually accelerating on the back of these higher prices. So I think this is temporary within a bear market. And the key thing you have to ask yourself is what's going to happen this year is Total production in the U.S. and Canada is probably going to exceed consumption by about 3 million barrels a day, and that's a back on the elasticity of supply, and that's the problem with crude oil. We create more of it, and we use less of it, and it has that elasticity to prices, which Bitcoin doesn't. Mike, beyond oil, we do see a lot of commodities trending higher. Lumber, for example, which was off like a rocket last year, is starting to get close to those levels again. Jeff Curry over at Goldman Sachs says he could see a commodity super cycle lasting a decade. What do you make of these calls of a super cycle coming back into the fore? I say good luck with that one. The time to buy commodities <laughs> was on the swoon last year. And the rest, lesson into commodities is when they go up, the, pri the higher price cure kicks in. And there's just too much profits to be made, most notably. And let's look at crude oil. The average cost of U.S. production is below $50 a barrel. That means you bring on more supply. Corn, the average cost of production is around 4 maybe a little above $4 a bushel. The price at 6 right now means more supply. And then for a commodity super cycle, you need China to take off. And a key signal last year was when China cut its triple R rate, it means China's not do taking off, it's going the opposite. So I look at selling commodities because it's the upper end of the range, and that's the lesson you learn in commodities. You sell them when they're high, and you buy them when they're low. Well, let's talk about something that is lower and wondering if you would be buying it here. Bitcoin, Mike, down about 35% from its all-time high in November. And I want to point to a column uh, on MLive that our Eddie Vandervolt and Ed Harrison put out this morning. They said, with mainstream adoption, the nature of cryptocurrencies changed. Before, they were uncorrelated with virtually all asset classes, bolstering the case to use as a portfolio diversifier. Now they're trading more and more like high beta tech stocks. Mike, what's your reaction to that? Bitcoin is in the price discovery mode, and yes, it is a risk on asset, and it has been, but I think it's transitioning into a risk off asset. I think it's putting in a very good support level on 40. Remember, this is the same price as February. And the key thing about Bitcoin is supply by code is, de is declining, and demand is really increasing, adoption is increasing. So prices must go up over time. It's just a question, does that trajectory, do those trajectories change? And I think they're accelerating. And the key thing about Bitcoin that's happening this year is long risk assets is fighting the Fed, and Bitcoin is, I think, is transitioning to an, a risk off asset, replacing gold in portfolios. And that's the key thing to think about Bitcoin is, if you're a millennial, you don't care about gold anymore, you want Bitcoin. So I think Bitcoin's on its way to 100,000. It's just a question of time. And it's probably putting in a good, a good floor around 40 at the moment. How much does 
you know, transaction times are so long, transaction costs are so high, um, the energy usage is critical. Um, when does that change for Bitcoin, for Ether, for for any of the mainstream crypto coins? It has been changing, Matt. For instance, there's second layers, just like a credit card. It's a second layer to transact in dollars. There's the Lightning Network. And most people who are buying Bitcoin on these dips are the people who don't plan and sell in over a long time. The people who are selling are the people who bought around 60,000 on leverage and are getting stopped out. And to me, that's what's happening in Bitcoin. It's a revolutionary asset technology that's just taking over. And as far as the electricity costs, it's what's, it's what's your source of electricity. And it's the number one thing about what humans do is we harness that, we harness energy to improve our condition. And I think that's what Bitcoin's doing. A lot of the sources of Bitcoin electricity now are from intermittent sources like solar and wind, and that's completely accelerating. Mike, in your research, you write how there's now about 16,000 crypto wannabes. When you're looking yeah. at all of these different wow. coins coming to the fore, be it Bitcoin, Ether, or a coin promoted by Matt Damon, which recently happened, that was kind of weird. <laughs> what does your checklist, <laughs> checklist look like in terms of which of these are sustainable, which of these have any staying power? The three musketeers. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the proliferation of crypto dollars. It's the most significant thing we need to bring out to our audience in this space. Most widely traded cryptos are crypto dollars. People call them stable coins, but if they all track the dollar, might as well call them what they are, crypto dollars. Tether's one of them, and then there's a dozen wannabes. The world has decided this is a better way to transact, and to me, that's what's happening. That's where it's going. There's going to be legislation and regulation there, but the U.S. isn't going to mess this up particularly because China's pushed back. And we have to understand, why did China push back? Because they don't like the fact that they have to pay for dollar, commodities in their dollars, and the dollar proliferation is accelerating through cryptos. All right, Mike, thanks so much. Great to get your insights this morning. That's Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence. Awesome. Now, coming up later today, Citigroup head of commodities research, Ed Morris, speaking of a potential super cycle. What does he think? That's at 2.30 p.m. in New York, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in for Anna Edwards in London. And also joining us now, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, what's going to be more interesting today, the jobless claims and PPI data we get at 830 or what Leo Brainerd has to say about the data at 10? I don't know. I'd say then who's the next New York Giants football coach? I guess Brainerd's <laughs> going to be important because it's a little bit of a mystery uh, there. But claims has been the most elegant chart out there. And what's really important is to put it in perspective, Kaylee, with Valentine's Day of 2019 and 2020. And the answer is one indicator of a fully employed America is nicely back to where it was and even better than it was on Valentine's Day bef before the uh, pandemic. This is popular, this is a distorted chart. It is population adjusted claims for the growing American population over the last 50 years. And what's so important is the spike up in the pandemic and the good news, we've come down, and on this one indicator, we're better than where we were in February of 2020. I like, uh, on Valentine's <clears throat> Day, I'll go to Bemelman's Piano Bar in the Carlisle. I think it's just the perfect place to take a date. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I, I, no, <laughs> no, no I, I have no cr clue I, I, other I, than Tim welcomes me when I go. I, I will, I will uh, see your chart and raise you another, <clears throat> Tom. The work of Bloomberg Economics has been incredible lately. Yesterday we had the GDP activity tracker and today we have a supply constraints indicator i showed the u.s chart earlier it peaked in the summer of last year and now it's coming down a little bit the same is true when you look at europe or the uk although um, uh, they are more constrained than we are here in the u.s the question is does it rise again do the constraints become um, more problematic as china faces increased omicron problems well pressures? there's a set of beliefs out there i'd say early in the week matt it was all gloom and you know 
though this, there was a set of belief that things were difficult. And we're seeing this today, I think Morgan Stanley publishing, that maybe the supply shortages are rolling over. I would really focus on the growth optimists, like James Diamond at J.P. Morgan. I believe he's got a busy calendar tomorrow morning. And I'd also mention Edward Hyman at Evercore ISI and his colleague Julian Emanuel, where they've slotted in 4.5% growth for this year. Those are optimistic statistics pushing against the gloom. I have to say, Tom, I've watched with fascination over the past few years, you and the team on surveillance have talked to economists, maybe diplomatically quiz them on their expectations for inflation, other economic measures, and the unknowingness of that. This time around for 2022, do the pros have a better idea? No, absolutely not. And the answer is that diplomacy is handled by Lisa Bramowitz. John and I are as <laughs> rude as all get out. Pharaoh sometimes is just out of control. But the, but the answer is the uncertainty here is off the chart. It's a really important important question, Danny. The, the pros have a huge amount of respect for the probabilistic measurement of risk versus the non-measurement of uncertainty, and there's a whopping amount of uncertainty out there right now. What I would predict is you're going to see more people adjusting their forecast through this year than we've seen in any recent time. Yeah, often people have to play catch up to what's actually going on. Thank you so much to Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, for joining us. And as for what else we're watching, I am watching PPI data at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. We've been talking a lot about supply chain issues. How much are they still evident in the data? 9.8% on the year-on-year -year metric is what we're looking for. 8% when you back out uh, food and energy. But we are expected to see a moderation, a deceleration in price growth on the month-on-month -month numbers. So I guess the question is, are producer prices peaking as maybe there are some signs of supply shortages maybe getting better Matt yeah well it looks like they're getting better but they could start to get worse at least in the short term this is part of the fascinating work that we're seeing coming out of Bloomberg economics yesterday it was Anna Wong here in the US today it, uh, Bjorn Van Roy and Tom Orlick showing us these um, supply shortage indicators supply uh, chain constraint indicators and a little bit later on today they're going to come out with their global GDP now cast which gives a real-time GDP reading of the world's biggest economies. And I think this work is really indispensable to the pros. To Danny's point, to Tom's point about um, the unknowingness, uh, is that really the, uh, the uncertainty um, going <laughs> forward? Uh, this is really helpful work that Bloomberg Economics is doing, and I think people are paying very close attention to it. Absolutely. I have to say, I make up words all the time. So, Matt, you need to call me out on that because I've developed my own dictionary at this point. All right. I am looking at TPG IPOing. Of course, this is the private equity powerhouse. IPOing today in the U.S. market. It's raised about $1 billion. It's thought to price in the middle of its range. This will be interesting to watch because IPOs have been pretty weak to end 2021. Not great for 2022 as well. We've seen a lot of people pull out of the IPO market. So, how will TPG fare? Of course, they're very used to IPOing. They IPO companies all the time. Will they perform better than some of the companies that they themselves push to become public? All right, more Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. We're going to hear from Abby Joseph Cohen, among many others, as we digest these economic figures and a hot CPI reading. This is Bloomberg.